about Robert Jackson that you didn't know? Yeah, there's a lot of things that uh, Phil s knew and said and that Murray did that, of course, I wasn't familiar with because I was after them. And uh, I was very, to me, it was very interesting. I learned a lot of things. I thought I knew everything up to yesterday, but now I know I didn't know everything. Because of his, his personality, and uh, I, I guess, I think he, he must have liked me. He had these uh, candidates to us, to John pointed out, and uh, I think that the, he felt we were all qualified. They were more qualified than I was, but we were all qualified. And who's he going along with best? Uh, he made a close relationship. So I think he thought that uh, he would all bear with me. So uh, he did that, of course, when my wife showed up, that, the, the ball game was over because the, she charmed the hell out of him like she does everybody else. And it just went, uh, started from the very beginning, it was just like that. He was just the greatest guy in the world. He, and you know, sending the sending a steward down to pick us up at the station and take us out the house was the, kind of the frosting on the cake. But he was always very, very funny, always interested in the family, and uh, and he talked a lot about a lot of things. So it was, I, I, as I said in my interview yesterday, uh, I have trouble sorting out the personal from the professional. I can't really be objective and, uh, and uh, uh, talk about the, the justice because of, we're so close. Uh, except my marriage, this is the greatest thing ever happened to me in my whole life. After the war, there were a lot of uh, older clerks that just came out of service. I, I spent five and a half years in the Army, so I was a little bit older. And Sandy Reed, his folks, I said one time after the war, he said, well, Mom, my law clerks are older. He said, they're getting married or having a baby or some disaster like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was true, there were guys there who actually had married war widows. Uh, and had children that way. So it was a, it was a it was a great great group. You know, in my two years, we had you no know, Elliot Richardson and Bill Coleman and uh, Lou Polk, a district judge. And we had John Stevens and Phil Town. And we had a lot of pretty outstanding people. So, you know, I felt <clears throat> I was in over my head, but I did the best I could. Well, I was <clears throat> you know outraged at the Nazi uh, atrocities, and you know. To anybody, to any party, there was a matter of policy. We we're going to exterminate the Jews and kill six million men, women, and children just because they were Jews. Just infuriated me, and I was also <clears throat> disappointed because I thought the lay press, <clears throat> excuse me, was covering the Nuremberg uh, trial very thoroughly. But the legal, I didn't think the legal publications were, and it seemed to me it was just wrong. And I was editor of the Law Review at that time, so I thought, well, why don't we? publish these documents so people can see what this is all about. So, you know, I, was, I wasn't I was young, but I was inexperienced. I didn't have the nerve, I just had the guts to write to Jackson and say, to express these feelings, <coughs> and said, if you will send us the, the uh, documents as they're filed, then we'll publish them. <coughs> so I got a letter back from Bill, uh, saying that they were happy about this, and they would do this, they would conform, and they did. And uh, so we got the stuff, and we printed them, and, uh, it's in, I think it's Wall 29, Temple Rock War. Right? Then, of course, I gave me, then when I, I started being coached by my mentor, Mr. LeBrum, by my wife, said, No, this is an opportunity, she'll get out and meet this justice and have a talk to her about the possibility of a clerkship, which I hadn't really thought about. So I, I did, went down. Uh, Mr. LeBrum said, Don't tell them you want to come down, tell them you're going to be there sometime and can they could you stop by the court while you're in town he said they can't they can't turn you down if you're already in town so I, of course i got the interview and we talked about roosevelt we talked nuremberg and all that and well, i thought the time was running out i said no i have to tell you mr just i had an ulterior motive in coming down here i want to talk to you about the false bit of a clerkship so he said well I, i've talked to some people but i haven't made any commitments so he said you know, send me an application, send me some we'll see. So shortly after, I offered me the job and they told me about the pay scale was $5,221 a year. As I, uh, uh, now, did you have any reason to talk to Murray, you know, your predecessor? I'm trying to think about that. I think I was, I was there one day uh, and went to Murray, went with Murray to the luncheon with the law clerks. And, uh, that's just as much as I remember uh, 
about that because I was, I was a new kid on the block and they had their conversation going. Of course, I became friendly with a lot of the other clerks uh, later on, but uh, I think Byron White was there that day. He was leaving. Uh, he had been Vince's chief clerk, and I think Frank Allen took over after that. But. Well, Jax wrote me a pretty detailed letter saying what the job's all about, what you're supposed to do, and recommend I read Frank Furter on the court and some other things. And then I, I showed, uh, I, he gave me a little handwritten note one day about a certain memo. And uh, of course, writing a certain memo for him was easy because his, he'd been in the law all his life and he knew the, the, new, the cases and he knew all the big issues. So he didn't have to tell him ABC. He, uh, and all I wanted to know was uh, where, the case, uh, excuse me, where the court case came from, who the judges were, who wrote the opinion, what the real issue was. He said, as compared to what they claim it was, and then you give your evaluation, say you either wrote, you wrote deny or grant or grant question mark or whatever. And, and he, I don't think he ever really read the cert petitions because he took my memo and the, to, took him to the conference and uh, he, knew, he, knew, you know, he knew the league. He didn't, he really didn't, after he didn't need a law clerk, actually. Uh, your main principal job was, of course, to once he had written some, was to check the records, see the facts were straight, check the citations, and uh, make any suggestion you want to. He said he expected the frankest criticism of the law clerk, and you know, that's what you did. But he was the ultimate uh, decider, of course. But he uh, told me very much what he wanted done, and uh, that's what's happened. The only, I was really shocked when he told me he had a case for me, because. Uh, he had told me, and it was pretty common knowledge, he tried to give every law clerk one case, but he always got a case where he was, he was writing for the court. There was no, no great division or anything, and there was no social or political significance to the case. But he, when he came back that day, he said, come on in, I got a case for you. <laughs> oh boy. And then he explained the, the, this case, which was uh, a real mess because there had been a conflict between the First and Second Circuits, and we were reviewing the Second Circuit, which had held that, that the bankrupt, that tax claims did not get interest beyond the date of bankruptcy. They were just like any other claim. They got priority in payment, but not any interest beyond the date of bankruptcy. But there were two votes to affirm, four votes to reverse, and three votes, Jackson, Black, and Rutledge, to affirm if possible. They thought it was there ought to be the right answer, but he wasn't. He wasn't sure that the the cases and the statutes would support that, and he didn't think that the lower court had made it clear, or that the guy in his brief or in his argument had made it clear. So he said, he said to, and of course Vincent was in dissent. So Black made the assignment. He gave it to Jackson to write for, see how he could. So I'm writing for Jackson, Black, and Rutledge. <coughs> and I really worked in that case, if you can imagine. And I finally came out with the answer. There was really no question. I went back to the Bankruptcy Act of 1898 and right up to date with all the intervening cases, the Act of 1926, the Chancellor Act, which was like 1938. And I, it seemed clear to me, and I got made clear in the opinion, there was really no question. Tax claims got priority in payment, but they didn't get any interest beyond the day of bankruptcy. That was the old English law and the American laws. What was you going to tell? <clears throat> so I finally got a draft typed up and sent to him and sent it over to him. And uh, <clears throat> it came back and said, OK to print. So I took it down to the print shop, which was down in the basement of the building at that time, and uh, got it printed. And it came back up. And he read that. And <clears throat> he said, uh, let's circulate and see if we had the votes. So that was the crucial time. So I. Uh, we circulated it, and of course, quickly, Douglas and Burton, who had voted to affirm, said okay. And, and Black and Rutledge came along. They were the ones that said affirm if possible. And then, what are these other four dissenters going to do? Frank Fire wrote a note and said, this is a very lawyer-like job, and I agree. Frank Murphy said, this is not the way I voted, but it's a lawyer-like job, and I agree. And Vincent just dropped his dissent. Stanley Reed was hooked on the First Circuit decision in another case, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't go along. So he just said that Jackson, note that Justice Reed dissents for the reasons stated in case number so-and-so. And he saw 
Jackson told me he saw Reed later, and Reed said, I'm sorry I couldn't go along with you on that case, Bob, but I think it was one of the best opinions you ever wrote. And Jackson said to him, well, it ought to be Jim Marsh wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> it was just fairly typical of, of his uh, approach. He's very generous with his praise, and uh, he, it's, it's just, a, just a marvelous uh, all-around uh, guy. No, he's a guy who had held every high job a lawyer could have in the United States, the Solicitor General, Attorney General, and Justice Supreme Court. And uh, he just, uh, no affectations, no ears, and no uh, great uh, idea of his own uh, Imports and he had, you know, a tremendous sense of humor. He could see the humor in, in everything. Well, the first to the last judicial ball, they were here, the, the, they had a ball at the White House for the judges and the law clerks. And I, I think probably the court, the, the uh, judges in the Court of Appeals, too, big crowd. And uh, we ran into him, Mr. Jackson, there, and he, he said, uh, you know, the best thing about these Washington parties is. As you see, for a few minutes, a lot of people with him a few minutes is enough. So, of course, I said, well, we'll move right on. He said, I don't want to talk about you. But, uh, and he, he, they had a, a uh, Fair Labor Standards case involving agricultural exemption that required discussion of what is farming, what isn't farming. And one of the chief clerks, who probably never been a farmer his whole life, wrote the opinion for Vincent. And one of the things he said was, the compost heat is no more. And on the copy we got, Jackson sent over to me, and he said, not, not so. On the fields fertilizer, on paper jurisprudence. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking about Frank Murphy. We had a case, had a case where Murphy had, had voted one way and gave us a, a now we were, uh, Jackson was dissenting, I believe, Murphy was, was uh, not with him. We had four votes without Murphy, and Murphy said no, he agreed with the dissent. So here we're in a case where the dissent's going to have five votes. <laughs> so Jackson said, if it wasn't Frank Murphy, I'd be inclined to let it go down, showing it was five dissenting votes on the same case. But he called Murphy and said, no, Frank, you better take another look at this case. And Frank said, of course, you know, Murphy had a life, lifetime clerk. Gene Gresson was Murphy's clerk for years and years. And, and it was common talk around the halls. The judges wanted to talk about an opinion. They didn't talk to Murphy, they talked to, talked to Gene Gresson. He later became a co-author with, with uh, Phil uh, St uh, was it Stern, yeah, Stern and Gresson yeah, on jurisdiction. But uh, it was just, he, he, he could see humor in all, every, every situation. And of course, the, the divorce case just drove him crazy. You know, the visible divorce was started with Williams versus Williams. And there was a series of them, but it just, you couldn't make any sense of them. Anyway, he, one of the things he wrote was that one thing people have a right to expect from the lawmakers is they will know if they're married, and if so, to whom. And then we had a, ca a case, I, I was asked what it was. A guy who had been arrested in New York, married and divorced there, moved to Nevada, married there. And then he died. The question is, who gets this portion of the state they're arguing about? So they ruled that the second wife in Nevada, to whom he's married when he died, was not his widow for this purpose. The woman in New York who he had divorced was not his wife but became his widow. So he said, you know, this, this really illustrates how crazy these cases are. So that was a pretty good example. Yeah, he was, but he, you know, he was so uh, unaffected, as I wrote in my article, he, he never called me on the telephone or used a buzzer. And he came, walked through Elsie's office and my door and said, you got a minute? And we go in, we talk. Of course, after the comments, he always came through my door and he said, come on in. <laughs> He'd tell me what happened, what we had to do. Uh, it was just, you know, it's just, a, a close, informal relationship wasn't anything uh, uh, formal about it. Was just, uh, it was just a relaxed uh, thing. He worked hard, as I, t I tell you. He, he worked, you know, people said he, he wrote so easily. We well, didn't write easily. He, he, he wrote well, and he had good command of language, and he knew everything. But he worked the things over. And as I, I've said before, he, I, if I, he gave me a draft opinion to, to critique, 
I put it back on his desk at five o'clock in quitting time. I knew that it would be back on my desk in the morning as soon as they came in. And uh, I found out later, we were out there for dinner one night and we went around the house. He had a lot of real Roosevelt memorabilia and all that out there, but up the third floor, he had a complete library of the, the Supreme Court reports and some other other uh, authorities. So he did all that work at nighttime, and he sent it back into me the next morning. And uh, but he he says he told his son Bill was down one time. Bill was going to work, want to write the book on Nuremberg, and he had drafts and he was working and, and the judge said this is pretty good and Bill said he still wanted to brush up some more and he said no Bill you're never going to write this book but you haven't learned that the best is the enemy of the good you get something good you know, let it go and that's pretty much what he did with the opinions he was never totally satisfied with an opinion but he when he got to where he could torture to death with improvements uh, he uh, he told me a story about the kid whose uh, father was sick and uh, the teacher said to him one day, how's your father? He said, the doctor says he's improved. So Tuesday, the doctor says he's improved. Wednesday, the doctor says he's improved. Thursday, the doctor says he's improved. Friday, he's dead. The teacher said, what did he die of? He died of improvements. So he, he applied that rule to your opinion right now. You get to a certain point, you to quit torturing to death. I think initially he was probably disappointed. Uh, and I, we're talking about two different things here, I think. One was the Nuremberg thing when, when uh, Vincent was appointed and he said he knew Vincent, they were friendly. And later on, there was another vacancy later on. In my but I know I, I said, one time I remember saying to him, I, mean, I think you're kind of defrauded because actually he had a, an understanding with, with FDR that if there, whatever he could, he going to make him chief justice. And of course, when Hughes, uh, retired. They agreed to view the background, the court fight, and all that. It would look pretty bad if he jumped over all the people on the court and named Jackson. So they should name Stone, who was a Republican and who was a solid guy. So that's how he went on the court. When it came to time for uh, when he was in Ehrenberg, when uh, who was Stone died, I did that. Uh, I think a lot of people thought at that time he would name Chief Justice. That's when the <clears throat> big problem came. And uh, of course, that story about the colonists in Washington, the, the story that I heard was pretty much the same. At, at that time, to be charitable, Bill Douglas's girlfriend was uh, Doris Fleeson, and she's the one that wrote the report that there uh, was well known that the Black and Douglas would resign if Jackson was named. And uh, of course, somebody, they said someone named yesterday, somebody sent Jackson to stop at Nuremberg, which he knew he didn't need because they were hit over, the, hit over heels with the case. Uh, and that really, it, it did infuriate him. And uh, it wasn't so much, I guess, the fact he didn't get the job, but the fact that where it happened and the back door stuff and uh, he, so he, he got mad and I think he had, I think both Elsie and Bill tried to tell him not to, not to send the message, but I talked to him about that and he, he said, you know, it's the only case, you know, they're, they're blaming, blaming him for revealing the, the inner workings of the court. He said, I, don't, I think the Supreme Court should be the only place where you're supposed to have a phony peace of people want to know what's happening and this is what's happening. So we, he did it. But he said he didn't, he didn't feel defrauded about the Chief Justiceship. By the way, did he have any regrets sending the cable? Did he have any regrets? I mean, now he's talking to you in 1947. Yeah. A little bit I of... I don't think so. He didn't say so. He, he thought he, you know, he exposed the situation that ought to be exposed. And uh, later, uh, he said no, he, he didn't really regret having not been Chief Justice. I, he said, I, I couldn't lead this court. Because you know he got four votes right off, right off the bat. These guys voting on a not, not a all with the merits of the facts of the law, but here's the four horsemen. You know every criminal defendant is right, every corporate defendant is wrong, uh, uh, every minority is right. Uh, so you get four votes right off the bat. By the way, for the tape, who are the four horsemen? Black, Douglas, Rodriguez, and Murphy, and uh, 
They, it's pretty much a, you know, the, the clerks really referred to him as a war horseman. And uh, it would have been a situation where he said, I, I couldn't lead the court. His, his great honor was Chief Justice Hughes. He'd been, when he was a young lawyer uh, in New York, Hughes was very active up there, and they worked together on the uh, Bar Association. As a matter of fact, the, uh, there was a group called the Association, the Federation of Bar Associations in Western New York. And he became very close with them then. Then, of course, as Solicitor General, he was close with the court, and as a matter of fact, was, uh, he had meetings with Hughes to talk about getting these New Deal cases uh, priority to get to decide whether or not these laws are good or whether they're bad. And he thought Hughes really led the court. And all the stories about Hughes is he really did lead the court. He dominated the court and he brought me to people into getting their cases done and all that. And if a guy had a case too long, he'd just take a background to somebody else. And he dominated the court not only by the way he ran it, but his philosophy, his approach to the law, and his approach to government and everything else. So Jackson had an idol there. And he realized he could never fill that sort of a role with that court because there was too many votes against him to start with. So, uh, and then also, he, he had a lot more interest. You know, he, he wrote a lot, he, he, he was called upon by the American Bar to dedicate their new headquarters, Stanford to dedicate their library, Philadelphia Bar to celebrate 150 years, and uh, he loved going to bar associations and law school and stuff like that. So he had a lot of stuff to do besides the court. And uh, when he was also, when he was, uh, as he was in his particular 48 term, in dissent a lot and uh, wrote a lot of concurrences too, he could write more freely when you run for yourself, you don't need to worry about getting, picking up any votes. So I think the whole, his whole regime was better, more relaxed uh, at that time. And I don't think he wasted any time worrying about whether he would be Chief Justice or not. Bill Coleman was the first black law clerk to serve on the court. The summer between my terms, it was announced he was coming down to be for Franklin. And I had, of course, made friends with the staff in the Marshall's halls and the Curve's halls and would have me lunch with them regularly. And they told me right away, if your friend comes down from Philadelphia, don't bring him over to our table for lunch. Here's the building where the judges are turning out a case every day about discrimination and equal equal protection of the law. And they say, we're not going to have lunch with him. <coughs> Excuse me. There was plenty of tables around here. We don't need to eat with you. But then my wife had a luncheon for the wives of the law clerks. And Lovita Coma shows up. And the old man across the street never us again. We've been friendly ever since we've been there, but he saw a Vito Coleman come into our house and we were finished. He had been selling, our kids loved what he called the Papa Price. The Papa Price would never cross our, our threshold again because wow. the Vito Coleman was there. And of course, I, my, a story I love about the Jackson at the end, you know, he asked me to stay for the second year, which was, I thought, a big compliment to me. And we went to, I was getting ready to leave, he had this cocktail party in Chambers for the law, other law clerks and some of the secretaries. And he and I were talking to Bruce Griswold, who was with Burton, uh, and lived next door, next to our chambers, so we were very close. And uh, Bruce said to the Justice, that Mr. Justice, I talked to a few people around here, and nobody can think of this ever happening before. So what's so great about Jim Marsh? And just like a flash, he said, Bruce, look, if you had worked this with this guy every day for two years, and he finally decided to go back to Philadelphia, wouldn't you have some kind of a celebration too? <laughs> so, you so, told me that. <laughs> so that was, we wound up on that, on that note. Of course, we kept in touch with him. I wrote to him, as, as Joe knows from the file, a number of times after that. and. Uh, I wrote one, we had one case, I think it was Winning Steel. I wrote to him after it came down and commented on it. And he said it had been circulated around the court for as, as an additional dissent. I think it meant he sent it around to Frankfurt. But uh, I, I kept in touch and I went to see him whenever I was, I was in Washington a lot, but we had a lot of government contracts claims. So I got down there and instead of getting the four-call train, I'd go there and maybe get the five. And I, uh, 
remember, he never, uh, whenever I call Elsie and say, how's oh, it a good day to come? She'd always say yes, and she could. And then I would come over and talk to him. He wasn't much of a drinker, and I wasn't much of a drinker. He knew I was only a beer drinker. Now, one summer, I remember I went in there, and he said, we'll have a little drink. He called Harry Parker. Harry had bought some beer, and he brought it out and got some ice cubes. And the first time I ever drank beer cool with ice cubes <laughs> in his chamber. So we had a lot of, a lot of fun. It was, it was a relationship you know, he got a lot of, and it was very demanding. You know, we all worked like hell. I worked a lot at night, and uh, you had to, to keep up. But, and I also, have a, it was interesting, I was the last clerk that served by himself. He always only had one clerk. After me, he had two clerks. So I said, he found it, he knew there was, there was no other one guy could do the job that I've done. Other people said, you must have screwed this thing up, up so bad, he knew it would take at least two guys <laughs> to get it back in shape. But he, and he hired, you know, Nuremberg, at that time, particularly, was so close to his heart. It was a grueling experience for a long, long time. They worked day and night, and they, it was just terrible. But Alan Cole, who was one of my successors, had been at Nuremberg as a member of the MP contingent that was guarding the, the prisoners. He had just graduated from Yale and was in the service. He was so impressed by Jackson's passion and eloquence that he made up his mind he's going to go to law school and get a law degree and become a clerk for Jackson. So he did that. When he came down to, to the apply, you now he, he had this Nuremberg background, and there was no way that Jackson could turn him down. It was just, you know, I all sold down, he had an unfair advantage over everybody else because of that experience. And he told us later, and he wrote an article about this, he <clears throat> told Jackson one time he had a picture of the four flags, flags of four nations together in Nuremberg. And Jackson said, no, that, that couldn't be. The Russians would never have our flag and their flag on the same level, the same place. So Alan said, well, Mr. Chess, I'm, I'm sure you're wrong, but I'll check my files. He went, went, went home, he dug out this picture, he had it enlarged, he had it framed, and he took it and gave it to the justice, and he said Jackson was just flabbergasted. And he, he said, well, I guess, he said, even I can make mistakes, so he made a mistake. So he gave, he put this picture right over his desk to remind him you got to be more careful what he said. And when he died, uh, he sent the, he had them send the picture back down on uh, his home out in uh, Bethesda. Sure. And there was just a, uh, another example of his thoughtfulness. He was a real thoughtful guy. But uh, then Nuremberg was, you know, the things to, close to his heart. And uh, I, I think that I had an advantage over the other guys, and I think Alan did because of the Nuremberg connection. But of course, with, with Jackson, when I went to, I was thinking about this, my, uh, first I'll say, Mr. LeBron was my mentor and my commanding officer in the war. We were both assigned to the same place in Syndicore in 1942 by a typical Army screw up. He wasn't supposed to be there, I wasn't supposed to be there. We were supposed to be different departments. We wound up together. He liked me for some reason, and we spent about a year in that uh, basically renegotiation department. Then he was made the chief legal officer up there. And he said to me, what are you going to do after the war? And I said, well, I guess I'll go back on the home mobile business. He said, no, you'd make a hell of a lawyer. Why don't we get you in a Temple Law School at night? There's now there's running an accelerated course. And whatever happens when you come back, you can face the law school and uh, uh, come, in the, uh, come to my firm. So we, I did that. He, you had to get, to get into law school without a college degree at that time, you had to had to give them all sorts of stuff. If the state board would agree you could be admitted to get a certificate, and the school would admit you agree they'd take you. You gave both to concur. You could get in, you could, of course you had to do the same work as everybody else, and you were held the same standards as everybody else. But after the, the war, uh, and we're talking about this Jackson thing, the said said, well, you know, you want to talk to him. He's the only guy in that court you could possibly talk to. He said, you have, he was born in Pennsylvania, and you were. He didn't get a college degree, you didn't. He went to night law school, you went to night law school. And your great friends, great admirer of, of, of President Roosevelt, so was he. So he said, you got a lot of things going for you. Get down there and, and uh, sell yourself. And of course, I'm saying, see, I, I just, I, I was so aware of the fact that I didn't have the damn degree like all these other guys did that I was, I learned something. 
between him and between my wife, they persuaded me that I was being too pessimistic. And uh, so, but the thing is, what happens in your life is chance goes so much. If I had, if the army had sent the brother I was supposed to, or me sent me I was supposed to, I would never met him. I never met him. I'd probably never gone to the law school, and this all would, we wouldn't be here today. So you have to. It's better to be lucky to have friends than to be real smart. And, and we're lucky to have you guys here today. This is terrific. Yeah. So I read the Times. I was very interested in democratic politics. I told somebody last time I learned my politics from my uncle, who said he was a banker. He said, you know, "Some days, days things go, things go wrong, and you think nothing possible go wrong, and you're deep down depressed." But he said, "At night." You kneel down and you say, well, thank God I'm a Democrat. Democrats came in, taking over the government, and they wanted to start all these new projects. There was no organization. There was, you know, we're starting fresh. So the Democratic lawyer in each county was going to, was going to be in charge of all these things. My cousin and I actually registered the applicants for the Civilian Conservation Corps, and we actually selected the first contingent from, from our area. Then they got organized. This has been terrific. Thank you, both of you. Oh, yeah, yeah, Jim. This has been a special time with both of you. Edit me any way you wish. Oh, yeah. Well, you, thank you very much for the opportunity. All, all of these guys and you too. You speak in these beautiful, complete paragraphs. It's it's like oh, you've really? been on. It's been like you've been on camera uh, your whole life. You know, it's it's, well, it's like David McCullough. And what he always says is what he does. Keep it tight, uh -huh. which is get the hell to the point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Women like to offer details. You always say get to the point because you get to the point in two minutes, and we like to offer details. I think the details <laughs> are important sometimes. So, this but this wonderful. has been very nice.